Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Education USA Western Hemisphere LLM webinar series. We are really, really thankful that you came here to represent so many countries around the world. My name is Samuel Reales and I am in Education USA Colombia. Today's session will be about the different LLM concentrations and the bar exam. Our representatives will speak for 40, 45 minutes, and then we have five or 10 minutes for questions and answers. Then you will be able to go directly to the Zoom rooms, and then we are going to be sending you by, via email the links to those Zoom rooms. So thank you once again. Um, enjoy the session. And remember, if you have any questions, you can write them also in the Q&A. Um, so, I'm going to give the floor to Ania. Yeah. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Samuel. So uh, we really appreciate all your time and, and for being here. We have a lot of content to cover. So I'm just starting it out. We're going to go fast. Um, but uh, we have the presentation and, and the recording, of course. Um, so my name is Anya Grossman. I am the Director of Global Outreach for the LLM program at Berkeley Law. Um, and I'll be just kicking off the conversation about LLM concentrations. So what type of LLM concentrations exist? So interestingly, the US legal education system doesn't actually require standardization in graduate legal degrees, um, including a master's of law and LLM. So that's why you see schools offering all different kinds of LLM. So for example, a general LLM degree, just LLM, um, a general LLM degree with the ability to specialize, earn a certificate, or otherwise demonstrate that you gained a particular area of expertise during your studies, um, or an LLM degree in a particular subject area. So that is what shows up on your diploma. Um, the difference here is what shows up on your diploma when you graduate and other information could also potentially show up on your transcript. So that's just the real difference here. They're all still real graduate law degrees. So just some examples from this panel. We have a number of really wonderful schools here. And as you can tell, a lot of us offer different types of LLM degrees with different types of concentrations, some specialized LLM, some general LLM, some have the ability to uh, earn a certificate or specialize in other ways. So if you're curious about each individual school and our offerings, join our Zoom rooms after this panel. So what is the point even of having different concentrations in all of this? Uh, so uh, we think that different forms of concentration allow law schools to highlight their areas of strength, whether that is depth, breadth, or a combination thereof. Um, and it also allows you to choose the program that works best for your future goals. So when you consider your goals for pursuing an LLM degree, use that to help you narrow down your choices. So some reasons that we have heard in the past from some of our students, you might be coming to explore a new area of study. You might be wanting to do your LLM to deepen your knowledge in your existing area of practice or specialty. Uh, you might want to pivot to a totally new area that you've never practiced before, but sounds really new and exciting. Um, you also might want to use a concentration or a degree to uh, show future potential employers that you have an area of expertise. Um, and you might also want to pursue US bar exam eligibility. All of this we'll talk about uh, shortly. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that the more focused you are on a particular area of study, the more you might wanna consider an LLM program offering a specialized LLM degree or a general degree with a certificate of specialization. On the other hand, if you're most excited about the ability to be flexible with course selection, to just take whatever type of courses you want, try a bunch of different things, then you might wanna consider an LLM program with a general LLM degree or one that has otherwise flexible course enrollment requirements. So just some quick do's and don'ts before I hand it off to my colleagues here. Um, do let the availability of specialized LLM degrees, certificates, or concentrations guide your course enrollment. But don't assume that concentrations will limit the course offerings. Many schools, including those with specialized LLMs and certificates, will offer courses in all different practice areas, regardless of their degree concentrations that they offer. 
So one thing you can do is look up the course selection at each school in which you're interested. That will give you the best understanding of what is offered and do show employers your areas of interest in other places. So your transcript, but also your CV um, and also show that in student groups, pro bono work and other ways of getting involved. But the most, most, most important thing is do find the LLM program that works best for you and your particular specific goals. So with that, I will hand it off to my colleague, Sarah. Thank you. So now that you kind of get a lay of the land of the different program options available to you, the big question is, how do you find the right one? So that's what I'm going to be covering. So I'm at UNLV, I'm Director of Graduate Programs. Um, and what you will find that there are a number of different specializations. So what you're seeing on your screen is just a sampling of the number of different degree uh, specializations available within the LLM market. There are over 200 law schools that are ABA accredited. 176 of them will offer an LLM. And they will vary from a general to specialized topics, but they will vary from popular topics like advocacy, entertainment law, uh, intellectual property, uh, to very niche topics like agriculture and food law to energy and environmental law um, to marine law. So I would think uh, think hard about what you're trying to accomplish within that program. If that general topic, the, the buffet of legal education is a good fit for what, what you want to do, or look at some of these areas of specializations. Um, on the next slide, you'll go over some of the research options of how to find the right program. So the Law School Admissions Council, you may have heard this in the other presentations of that organization, has a directory on their website. So at lsac.org, uh, you can go through the directory and put in your parameters of the, the type of program you're looking for, the location of the program. Maybe you have family located in a certain region or area of the United States. Maybe you already know that in intellectual property if your is your passion and that's the type of LLM degree you're looking for, you can put in those parameters at the LSAEC website and it will show you which programs specialize in that particular area. LSAC gives all of us universities a survey to fill out every summer, so it's all neutral information that's received. Um, that lists all of the ABA accredited programs. LLM Guide is another option that is kind of not neutral. So you will have a directory that puts up information on the programs, but those universities that pay for sponsorship will come up at the top of the list. And so LLM Guide is great for kind of that informal conversation. Uh, you've been admitted to a number of different programs or you're thinking of applying to a different programs, you put it in the chat. Uh, and you get feedback from students, from alumni, from other people that are involved. So it's great for informal uh, research gathering. Uh, but one of the other larger uh, resources I recommend to students is to go directly to the source. So all of us that are ABA accredited have to apply for approval for the ABA. The ABA compiles a list of all of those approved programs and lists them on their website. So if you're looking for a very specific topic or you're looking to know uh, what a specific university is offering. You could see all of that on the, the pages that I'm going to show you in just a moment. So with the Law School Admissions Council, again, that's that lsac.org. This is the beginning portion of their website. You've got a couple versions on how you can get to that information. But um, if you go to lsac.org, that toggle at the top, choosing a law school, scroll down to the bottom of the page, um, and it will get you to that LLM and other programs uh, link area. And once you click on that, uh, you'll get to the search parameter page. And so that option is putting in that keyword, putting in that state that you want to search for. All those ABA approved programs will come up. Now, when you get the results, you do want to look. Some schools offer an LLM. Some will do a master's or certificate. So make sure it has that LLM notation behind it. Or if you scroll to the next page, you'll see them all listed by state. Um, so if you don't know what area you want to look for a school that is all in Arizona or California or Minnesota, you can see all the different universities that are in that area. And then once you click on the school, you'll see the different degree programs they offer. Another option would be looking at that ABA list that I mentioned. So with that ABA list, I will put a hyperlink in the uh, chat box uh, once I'm done talking, but you will be able to see by university. So you see on the screen, University of Alabama offers three different degree programs. So if you know which school you want, 
you could look at each of the individual schools and see the degree program. And then, of course, go to the university website directly to then look for all those updated details. Um, or uh, in the next page, you should be able to see uh, them by topic area. So this is my favorite way of looking it up. So if you know that you want to if you are trying to explore the different subject areas, you didn't know that there's an LLM in um, space law, you can actually go through, I believe there's two different LLM programs in space law, um, but you can go through by topic area and discover areas you may not have known existed by looking by subject, or it will also list all the general programs. And so that is, those are the programs that my colleague mentioned where it gives you a little bit more flexibility to go through um, and pick and choose your courses. Again, there are uh, 176 ABA law schools offering LLM programs. They will differ from uh, big public schools, small private schools, large programs that have 10 LLMs, uh, small programs from 10 LLM students to large programs with 200. There's gonna be a flavor that matches your requirements and your needs. So do your research. It's never too early to start and take advantage of programs like this to talk to the schools. What you don't may, may not realize is many of us are the ones reviewing your application. So connect with everybody and ask them about their programs. And now I will uh, pass it along to my colleague uh, from Boston University to talk about uh, kind of choosing that process. And thank you for that and welcome everyone. So my name is Maureen Tracy Leo. I'm the director of the American Law Program and happy to talk to you for just a few minutes about whether you should choose a specialization that relates to your work experience. And the answer to that question, of course, because I'm a lawyer, is it depends, right? For many of our students, yes, it makes perfect sense to be a bridge from your practice to your LLM program. One of my favorite students was a judge in Pakistan, the youngest appointed judge there. He had a commitment to criminal defense, came to the United States, Boston University to get his LLM, studied criminal law and is going back to Pakistan to reform the criminal defense system there. So for him and for students like him, they have a deep knowledge, they get an LLM in that area, they go back and hopefully they make their mark in their own countries or elsewhere. Um, for other students, it can really be a great chance to pivot. This is your chance to diversify your experience, to try a new subject and to build upon past experience, yes, but also develop new areas and new skills of expertise. The good news is, of course, as we flip to the next slide, is that it's all good. It's like ice cream. Like every flavor is awesome. If you like chocolate more than I like strawberry, they're all really great. And you should consider that with your LLM program as well. The important thing, however, that you don't need to do when you choose ice cream flavors, but you do need to do when you select LLM courses of study is get good advice. And there are lots of places to get it. You can get it from in-country members, who's mentors, who's doing in your country what you admire or respect. Ask them how they got there and what value an LLM degree would have. What's your dream job? Look at their credentials. Compare your credentials with those. And all of us at any of our schools or any other in the United States are happy to help you. Our collective interest is that you land in the right spot for you. So sad as I am to leave this thing, uh, this slide with ice cream, I will happily pass this to my colleague now, Anna Shim, who will talk about our next portion here. Good evening. Um, I'm Anna Shum I'm from Florida State University. I think that many of you, when you jump into an LLM program, um, you have the goal in mind of taking a bar exam you know, after you graduate. Um, but the question is, so do I need to take a general LLM program? Can I do a specialized LLM program? And so the short answer is um, you don't have to complete a general LLM program to take a bar exam. You can complete a specialized LLM. But there are just a couple of things that you should keep in mind in choosing your programs. For example, the course requirements. Um, you want to make sure that the courses that you're required to take in your LM program would count towards the bar exam. Typically, um, you won't have much of a trouble in a general LM program um, as the program is fairly flexible um, with course selection. Um, but with a specialized program, some of those courses may not satisfy bar requirements. So for instance, the DC bar requires you to take 26 credits and each of those classes taken, they need to be substantially concentrated on a single subject that is tested on the uniform bar exam. 
And so in a situation like that, if you're in a really specialized program like environmental law, then you're probably not going to be able to meet the bar requirement unless you take a lot more credits to graduate, which you probably don't want to. Um, the next thing to consider is the program credit requirement. Um, it's in a general program, there's lots of flexibility. Um, you can take whatever you want most of the time, but for a specialized program, um, you might be required to take a certain number of credits from a list of specialized classes, or you simply need to take all the classes from a list of specialized um, classes, which then makes it very tricky when you're trying to satisfy bar requirements. So keep that in mind. Um, last but not least is the nature of the program. And to be more specific about that, it's more like the delivery method. Is it an online program? Is it an in-person program? As some jurisdictions may have um, specific requirements where they don't accept online credits, though a lot of the jurisdictions have been fairly flexible these days because of COVID reasons. And so let me just zoom in and um, kind of look at um, some programs. Um, these are the programs that we offer at our um, law school. You can see that the general program similar to many other programs is that there might be one or two requirements, but other than that, you can take whatever you want, which is the easiest way to satisfy bar requirements. And the most difficult one is pretty much our environmental law program where you just have to take all the credits that you need to graduate under that specific curriculum, which makes it pretty tricky when you wanna take a bar exam, unless the jurisdiction that you're interested in is very flexible. So that brings me to the second question. Do I need to take a specific course to be able to take a bar exam? Unfortunately, it just depends on the jurisdiction that you're interested in. Some bar exams are more flexible and then some are more restrictive. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be more precise with this and it drives me nuts. But in general, some jurisdictions um, require introduction to American law, um, legal writing, professional responsibility, some of the jurisdictions offer waivers. Some jurisdictions may also require you to take a specific course out, um, outside of the law school. Um, you should be, keep that in mind, especially if you are um, studying in one jurisdiction and you'd like to take the bar exam in another jurisdiction. But most jurisdictions provide a range of courses that you can take to satisfy the bar requirements. So there's some degree of flexibility. Um, right now you have lots of questions about the bar exam because I've brought that word up so many times. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague who will provide you an overview. Excellent. Very good. And I'm sure that you, uh, all of you are getting so much information today. So hopefully this is very helpful. So, so my name is Aaron Ghiradelli. I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Admissions at LMU Loyola Law School. And we're going to cover a few things about the bar exam. First of all, one thing to consider is that in the US, uh, each state has different rules and requirements for students to take the bar exam. So that means that if you're planning to practice in different states, you will have most likely to take exams in those states. And also one thing to remember, not every state unfortunately allows foreign students to take the bar exam. Also the top question that we usually get when talking to students is, do I truly need to take the bar exam? So one thing to consider is you don't have to take the bar exam uh, at all costs. So it's not like a natural consequence of the LLM. You can definitely complete your LLM and be happy with it. The LLM is one of the most prestigious legal, legal degree uh, in uh, that will play an important role in your profession. You need to take the bar exam or we usually suggest you to take the bar exam if you want to practice law in the US, mostly if you are already living in the US, if you are planning to target actively clients from the US, or if it helps you in terms of uh, be, uh, have more prestige, maybe at your law firm or at your future job, or whether it helps you get your license in your country, like it happens, for example, in France or in Italy. And let me share some more information. Once you decide that the bar exam is a good choice for me, uh, for me how do you know where to take the bar exam? So our recommendation usually is to focus on the state where you are either planning to practice or the state where you have the strongest connections, which most likely will be the state where you completed your law school degree. Also, one important thing to remember, you can qualify for a bar exam in the US, even if you're completing the LLM in a law school that is from another state. For example, you can 
uh, take the LLM in California and qualify for New York. You can take the LLM in New York and qualify for California. The most popular options for students are the ones that you see here on the slide. And also a very important resource for you is the website that you see here at the bottom of the screen, where you can find a full list of different bar exams, all the requirements, very detailed information. And in general, you may hear people saying that the bar exam is incredibly difficult, the bar passage rate is very low, uh, which is technically true, but don't be discouraged by that. Uh, the passage rate is very low, most likely because there are many students who take the bar exam with no proper preparation. But if you do a very good job in your LLM and after the LLM preparing for the bar, I'm sure you can have a good result. And also, let me tell you more about the structure of the bar exam. So the bar exam is usually held in two different days. Uh, fairly similar from state to state in terms of structure. Uh, what you see here is on day one, you focus on writing uh, and that changes from state to state. You can see a few examples here, California and New York and the UBE exam in terms of number of essays or when you're gonna take the essays and so on. The second day is the same for all bar exam, which is the day of the multiple choice questions where you will have uh, 200 multiple choice questions and during the entire day testing you on different topics. And let's talk about the topics. So if we go to the next slide you will see, these are the topics that will be tested under the multiple choice question portion of the bar exam. We know in advance which topics, which, which topics will be tested and how many questions you will get per topic. What you see on the right is an example of a multiple choice question just to show you the length of these questions, which are pretty long. So it requires you a lot of work in terms of practicing and making sure that you're gonna become very quick. While on the first day, the day of the writing portion, we can go to the next slide. You can see how you can be tested on the same subjects we have seen before, the MBA subjects, plus all these additional subjects. The tricky thing is that in the writing portion, we don't know in advance which topic will come out. So unfortunately, you will have to prepare for all the topics just to make sure you're gonna be ready for the bar exam. And if I remember correctly, this concludes my presentation. So hopefully this was a good overview on the bar exam in the US. You have my contact information here. My colleague, uh, Andrew, will continue covering the bar exam. And also feel free to join me in my Zoom room after the presentation if you want to talk more. Thank you so much, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you to, thank you to all of you joining us today. Um, so my name is Andrew Horsfall. I'm the Assistant Dean of International Programs. I'm from Syracuse University College of Law in Syracuse, New York. And so as the only New York law school here on the panel, that gives me the Herculean task of trying to introduce to you in just a few slides um, as much information as I can about the requirements for eligibility to the New York Bar Exam. So I will attempt to do that first with a table here that you can see. Um, the goal with this discussion is not really to get too granular with too many details about each and every requirement for eligibility and then the bar exam and licensure process, but at least to give you some organized way to think about or how to demystify some of these requirements. I like to think about the requirements in three different layers or three different buckets. And if you look here on the screen, you can see going from left to right, First, we have what are more like administrative requirements. So this is really the paperwork. These are the things that you need to do um, in terms of getting documentation over to the New York State Board of Law Examiners so that they can see that you have the, the foreign credentials <clears throat> along with the LLM degree, which I'll talk about in a minute, that will render you uh, eligible to sit for the bar exam. <clears throat> I will get into more details about those, bo those boxes uh, in a moment, um, but moving to the middle of the screen, you can see the academic requirements. That's really where we here as LLM programs sit in terms of spending our time giving you advice uh, and guidance around how to um, use or frame or spend your time during the LLM program to prepare for the bar exam. New York has a few specific academic requirements. There are a few specific courses that you need to take in order to become eligible for the bar exam. And then there are some additional courses that can simply help you prepare for the substance that you'll be tested upon. Uh, as we saw earlier in Aaron's presentation, 
um, there are some courses and subjects that it might benefit you to take those classes during your LLM uh, that might not be required, but are nevertheless recommended. And so this middle portion of the screen with these academic requirements is really where we can provide you with some um, important and key uh, advice and guidance in that respect. And then of course, there are other additional professional requirements, other requirements, other components to the bar exam, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail um, later as well. But hopefully this gives you kind of a starting point to visualize some of these requirements. Um, but we can move into the paperwork first. I think it's helpful to give you all, and I, perhaps this link was shared earlier, but at least give you a starting point. And I think it's helpful for you to know that all of the guidance and the advice that we give you is really taken from the rules set out by the New York State Court of Appeals and the New York State Board of Law Examiners. So we're interpreting those rules, we're reading that information, and we're giving you some advice along the way. Ultimately, it is up to the discretion of New York State to decide whether you are eligible to sit for the bar exam. Not up to the LLM programs, not up to the folks like um, myself and my colleagues here. And so really it's helpful for you to know, to save and to review these rules um, as soon as you can. Um, but then one thing that you can do even today is to submit your foreign evaluation form with the New York State Board of Law Examiners. This creates your profile with New York State so you can start receiving information from them. You start giving them your bio data, information about your foreign education, and start um, gathering details about what else is required for you from the more paperwork perspective. Um, arranging your documents is important. If you um, are in your home country, this is the best time to start reaching out to your law school, to your bar authority, whichever um, either government agency, quasi-government authority in your home country that licenses lawyers. It's very likely you'll be needing to work with them to get documentation sent to New York on your behalf. It's worth mentioning here too that unfortunately, New York does not want to hear from the universities. And so documentation you send to your LLM program will not help you in terms of um, satisfying some of these paperwork requirements. It's critical that things like your transcripts, your diploma, your law license are all sent directly from your foreign institution to New York. And so the sooner that you can do that and start working on that in your home country, the better. <clears throat> With regard to the LLM, so these are the academic requirements. Uh, I think it's been mentioned a few times before, but you do not need to take an LLM degree in New York State if you want to take the New York State bar exam. <coughs> Excuse me. So hopefully that gives you some, some more flexibility and some options when thinking about an LLM program. But there are obviously academic requirements, so courses that you need to take to satisfy um, New York's academic requirements. Um, and this is really where we can come in to give you some advice around that. There's the MPRE, the Multi-State Professional Responsibility Exam. Because professional responsibility or a legal ethics course is required as a class for your academic requirements, it's helpful to take the MPRE, I think, soon after you finish your professional responsibility um, course. <clears throat> and so again, this is something you'd want to talk to your LLM program about in terms of mapping out when you do that. Uh, and there are uh, last but not least on this slide, um, many pro bono opportunities available. It is a requirement that you satisfy 50 hours of pro bono uh, work. <clears throat> and um, one thing that we do quite well here in the United States is to build opportunities for all of our students to pursue pro bono work outside of the law school uh, or, or inside the law school as well. So just keep that in mind and keep that as part of your academic plan during an LLM program. Last but not least, of course, there are even more additional requirements beyond just the LLM program. It's not as simple as coming to do your LLM, sitting for your two-day bar exam. There are um, some additional things to think about as well. One of these is the skills competency requirement. I won't get into too much detail about this here, but you simply need to know that there are five different ways to satisfy this particular requirement. And you should be researching and consulting with colleagues early on to decide which pathway will be best for you uh, and consulting with your law school uh, about that as well. <clears throat> and then think about eligibility beyond the two-day UBE here in New York. We have a uh, New York law course. This is an online law course with a few a series of videos and modules that you'll watch 
And then soon after that, you'll take an online New York law exam as well. So there are some additional uh, layers to the exam that we refer to. Um, New York is still one of the only states in the United States that has an in-person character and fitness interview also. I believe they're still doing that with the pandemic, but there's maybe on Zoom at this point. But again, just know that all of this is gonna take a lot of time. Um, sometimes it can take you know, a year or longer uh, to satisfy all these requirements beyond your LLM program. And so the sooner you start thinking about these requirements, um, the better. <clears throat> I will leave it at that. I can take additional questions maybe later. We can talk in my chat room over Zoom in the future or on email. But I think at this point, this is probably enough information to keep you busy for a while. And I'll turn it over to my colleague. <clears throat> So you've heard a lot about some of the requirements to take the bar. And so we're pivoting a little bit to the actual bar preparation. So what does bar preparation in the United States look like after your LLM? Well, first, and if we go back to one slide here, you'll see a lot of happy graduates. They have gotten their LLM degree and hopefully they've had the best year of their lives. That's our hope for all of you. And after you go to your graduation ceremony where your family and friends hopefully will applaud your significant effort, then, and here's the next sad slide for who's ever advancing them, this is what it takes to pass the bar exam. So immediately after you graduate, you will do if you want to pass what this student is doing and countless others. You will go to the library, you will tell everyone that you love, that you will see them at the end of July, and you will dedicate yourself to the task before you. Uh, the bar exam more than anything else is an English test, and there are LMs who pass it every year, and you can be one of them, but it will require unflinching dedication. We're not to have a clicker, but I'm clicking. The, the bar exam for many people, for all of us really, is much like a marathon. So this is a picture of the Boston Marathon where I am this past year. And like, uh, like the, the marathon, a bar exam requires patience, persistence, and dedication. And it rewards those who are just willing to keep moving. And if you keep moving, then at the end, you'll finish like them. You may be way in the back of the pack or you may be uh, right in front, but the bar exam requires a passing score, not an A+. So here are some tips that are going to kind of get you to your finish line then. So I'll pass it back to my colleagues here. Excellent. Thanks so much, Maureen. And I'm Allison. I'm the Director of Graduate Admissions at Michigan. And here I'm here to talk about you going through the process of, and going through the trouble of studying for and sitting for the bar exam, and you successfully cross the finish line to be admitted to that state's bar. Um, now you might be wondering, so if you're admitted to the bar in one state, are you limited to practicing law in only that state, or are you allowed to practice in other states? So the simple answer to this question is that yes, you are limited to practicing law uh, only in the state in which you're admitted. Um, but because we're talking about lawyers here, um, the answer isn't quite as simple as it might appear on the surface. Um, there are processes that can allow you to eventually uh, practice law in other states. Uh, for instance, a potential option could be sitting for the bar exam uh, in another state, but of course that takes time and effort uh, to study for another bar exam. So some factors you might want to consider if you want to practice law in another state uh, are researching the bar eligibility requirements of the, state, of the new state where you would like to practice, and you can actually contact bar exam examiners of the state directly to verify the conditions that you'll need to meet. Um, and even if you aren't admitted to another state's bar, um, your actual legal profession could give you some flexibility. So for instance, in some states, uh, if you're registered to work as in-house counsel, uh, you will be able to practice in that state uh, without having to take another bar exam. Um, and also the state where you're admitted to practice can also play a role in determining your path to gaining an admission to practice in another state. Um, we mentioned the UBE, which does have the benefit of allowing you to transfer your UBE score to other jurisdictions. But do keep in mind that even if you have a transferable UBE score, you'll still need to apply for admission to individual jurisdictions and also satisfy uh, their special state requirements. But now on the next slide, uh, we can talk about a specific process that some states provide uh, called admission on motion that will allow you to practice in a state without having to take that state's bar exam. 
Um, and we talked a little bit about the NCBE guide. Part number 12 in that guide is an excellent resource for admission on motion requirements for different states. Um, something that I do want to note is that gaining admission uh, isn't an immediate process. Uh, it usually requires time and money. Uh, so for instance, for some states that allow admission on motion, it's pretty common to see that they'll require you to practice law um, in another state for maybe three out of the past five years or uh, five out of the past seven years are, are pretty common. Um, states also usually require a fee for an admission on motion, uh, which can be hundreds of dollars or even more than a thousand dollars. So um, these are factors that you will wanna take into account um, if you're thinking about admission on motion. And on the next slide, I also wanna note that there's still more wrinkles with admission on motion because not every state allows for this. Um, so California and Florida are a couple of examples of states that do not allow for admission on motion. And some states have very specific or particular requirements uh, for admission on motion. Um, so for instance, I'd love to practice law uh, in Hawaii, but chances are I wouldn't be able to gain admission on motion uh, anytime soon unless I somehow end up being uh, on the faculty at the University of Hawaii Law School. Um, that's one of the requirements that uh, Hawaii has. Or similarly in uh, South Carolina, uh, they allow for admission on motion only for the dean or a tenured faculty at the University of South Carolina or the University of Charleston Law School. So could be some incentive to go into legal academia uh, if you're thinking about something like that. Um, and then finally, on the last slide, um, something that I do want to note is that uh, when you hear about admission on motion, you might hear the word reciprocity a lot. And some states that allow for admission on motion will require reciprocity, uh, which means, for example, that if you're in state number one, um, they will allow for admission on motion for applicants who are admitted to the bar in state number two, um, only if state number two returns the favor of allowing admission on motion for applicants from state number one. So reciprocity, reciprocity can be a little bit of a hurdle if you're licensed to practice law uh, in a state that doesn't allow for admission on motion and thus doesn't have reciprocity uh, with other jurisdictions. Um, however, some jurisdictions like DC, Illinois, Massachusetts um, don't have a reciprocity requirement, which means that you don't have to worry uh, about uh, uh, any kind of reciprocity requirement if you are uh, applying for admission on motion. And I do want to note that chart uh, 13 of the NCBE guide uh, is a great resource for if you're looking to uh, reciprocity requirements. Um, so the last thing that I want to note is that, you know, parsing the rules for pra practicing law in other jurisdictions can be really complicated. Uh, it can take time, but you do have a bunch of resources uh, at your disposal, um, such as the NCBE guide. And as long as you take the time to do your research, uh, you can definitely navigate this process successfully and your legal education will certainly help out with that. Uh, so now with all that said, let's take it back to Maureen. All right, and this is our last little segment here, folks. Thank you for your attention. And uh, now I'm going to talk about preparing for the bar exam in a different state. So the United States is a big place. We've got 50 different states and Andrew is here from Syracuse. I'm sure that he would like to mention how nice it is to study for the New York bar exam in New York, a place like Syracuse, but you can study for the New York bar exam, which many of you will take in any state in the United States. And most of the, most LLM students will take the bar exam in either New York, California, or uh, Washington, D.C. Um, the reason for that, and if we could advance the slide, when you go to the bar exam, you will see uh, a, a vast testing center like this. You will actually go to the state to take the bar exam itself. But for the preparation, you could easily do many different places, and there are many different ways to do it. So how do you prepare for the bar exam? Well, you learn from anywhere. Uh, certain courses that you'll take during your LLM program will provide an excellent foundation for bar preparation. And almost every LLM program in the country will have academic advising for their students. 
Many schools like mine has a formal academic advising program, but even if your school doesn't have a formal academic advising program, there are committed LLM professionals who want to help you. So find an advisor to give you good advice about what courses might best prepare you for your long-term goals. And if one of those long-term goals is to pass the bar exam, Courses like contracts and corporations and other kind of foundational courses can be extremely helpful. And you can start your bar study in the fall and the spring during your LLM year to the extent that you get good foundational knowledge of those core subjects. Some schools have fundamental courses, ours does and a number of other schools do. And that allows you to take particularly tricky topics that you may find on the bar at a lower credit point. So as an American lawyer, I had to take four credits of property I didn't want to take four credits of property as a European or a South American lawyer or someone for wherever you are in the world. You definitely don't want to take four credits of American property law, but it's tricky. So taking it on a shorter credit basis might be to your advantage. Many of you will do some preparation during school, if not all of you, but the majority of your preparation for all of you is done in the summer via commercial prep course that is taught and executed by a commercial bar prep company. Now, these are going to cost you some money and you're not gonna to wanna to spend the money because you've already spent a lot of money to come to the United States to study your LLM, but this is not a place where you want to save pennies. Yeah, uh, every lawyer I know in the US has taken a commercial bar prep company course because they study the test and they will teach you what you need to know. And if you put it the time, then you've got a really good chance of executing to the, at least to the best of your ability on this very difficult exam. So what kind of companies might you endeavor to look at? There are a bunch of them and they're all good. Kaplan, Barbary, Temis are three of them. Most law schools uh, will not endorse one or the other, but you could do due diligence. They often have free giveaways. They want your business. And this is America. Capitalism has some positive components. So they have to compete against each other and maintain comp competitiveness so that you could feel confident with any of them. So with that, you can do this. The fact that you're here on a Friday night says a lot about who you are as learners. It says a lot about, about who you want to be, your goals, and what you might want to achieve with your degree. It was truly an honor to get to speak to all of you about your path. And this was a lot of information to take in. I work in this industry and my head is spinning, but this PowerPoint will be available to you as are all of us. So feel free to reach out to any of us with questions and these slides will be available so you could digest it at a calmer and cooler pace. But we hope it gave you a good introduction overview of these really important and exciting topics for your study and career ahead. Excellent. I'll just, I guess, jump in very quick to thank my colleagues um, for getting through what was so much content and information in, in time as well. So it looks like we have some time for, for questions for the next few minutes, perhaps, and then we will be sharing links to our personal Zoom rooms where we'll be in for as long as needed um, to, to continue the discussion school by school with all of you. So thanks, everyone. And um, yeah, maybe we can take some questions. Looks like we have a hand up first from Natasha. Hi, let me open my camera. Hi, thank you so much for taking the time um, to help us with this uh, very difficult issue uh, to digest. So um, I have a question about the New York bar. Uh, I have the impression that I heard that we don't have to to have an LLM was just that we do this. How can we take the credits if we don't don't go to the LLM route? Uh, would that be possible? Okay, so um, good question. I welcome perspective from my colleagues, but I don't know of any pathway for foreign educated lawyers other than pursuing the LLM degree. So having been conferred the actual LLM degree, but within that program, satisfying very specific academic requirements around courses that you need to take, minimum numbers of credits, for example, a writing course, a course that will expose you to the American legal system, professional responsibility or a legal ethics course, and then at least six credits of subjects which are tested on the bar exam. And so I believe that that is, I think, the singular pathway, the only path that you have uh, as a foreign educated uh, lawyer to become eligible to sit for the New York bar exam. 
And if I may add, uh, maybe California is one of the few states or maybe the only state who allows uh, international students to take the bar exam with no LLM if they're already licensed to practice in their country. Uh, but having said that, uh, I, as someone who did the bar exam in California, New York, and comes from another country, I don't recommend go straight to the bar. I highly recommend to take the LLM in any case, even if you are a lawyer and you're planning to take the bar exam in California. There is no way you're going to pass with no at least one year of legal education in the U.S., yeah, that's that's the impression I had. Thank you for clarifying. It's just that this random sentence that I think Andrew said uh, gave me the impression that uh, it was just about the credits. And if I may complement my question, uh, all the LLMs right now must be in person, correct? So that's a good question. So <laughs> currently, New York has... Um, waived their requirement that LLM credits must be taken in person. So they're allowing for distance learning. They're doing this, unfortunately, sort of on a semester by semester basis. And so we've just learned this week that LLM students can be taking courses through a distance learning modality and that those distance learning credits for the spring 2022 semester will, will be fine, will be acceptable for New York. Um, it has been that way since the beginning of the pandemic. I will tell you, one, there's no way for us to know if they will continue to con um, extend that, that waiver of strict compliance. My sense is that they will not. I think they're eager to get back to having LLM programs and students operating fully in person, but that's just, a, um, that's just my sense. So you should plan, I, I think all of you, you, sh you should plan to be pursuing an LLM degree here in the United States in, in person if your plan is to become eligible for the New York Bar exam. And then just to quickly jump in, that's where that NCBEX website can be of benefit where you can see all the other states. So for example, the state of Nevada doesn't require the LLM to be eligible for the bar exam. Um, there, so you can have to look, do your research to find the other states that may not require it. Is whether or not that's the best path if you're trying to find employment or if you just want the, the ability to say you passed a US bar, you have to think about that. It's an expensive investment for bragging rights, um, time commitment and money commitment um, for, for the study. Uh, but those are elements you'll have to think about and do your research on. And after you pass the bar exam, there are still continuing obligations for licensure. So every year we pay certain money every year to maintain our law licenses in whatever jurisdictions we're in. And if you're not practicing in those jurisdictions over time, those uh, add up. There are also continuing education requirements in some, some jurisdictions as well. And I think I had mentioned the importance of getting advice. And in-country advice, I think, can be particularly valuable. What do your employers, what does your market value? Do they, mark, do they value the LLM in addition to bar licensure? And is bar licensure even, is it even important? In some countries, our graduates, it's highly valued in the marketplace. And in other countries, it's not. And, but so they benefit from the education of getting an LLM in the US and don't have to trouble themselves with the bar exam. There is a sense that students have to take the bar exam because you're all high achieving. And so you come and it's the path of next this, uh, natural stage. But in point of fact, for many students, it's not necessary. And you should get advice to determine whether it's worth your investment of time and money. If it is, we're here to help. But if it's not, you've proven yourself a whole lot better of a summer. There's a question in the chat here about pro bono. I don't know if people saw it, but thank you, Anya Grossman had said, the pro bono work can be done anywhere in the world, but you'll need an attorney. Oh, okay, this has been answered. Thank you. There was a question about pro bono work. So you could read that in the chat. And then a question from Ivanez also. Hello, yes. I'm gonna turn my camera on. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Hi. Question is uh, about the bar test. I've been reading about it, and um, so I'm not sure if I feel like uh, fully satisfied with the uh, answers because um, there's still questions in me. For example, I read that uh, for the bar, not all states accept international students. Uh, for example, I don't know if 
maybe I read wrong, but uh, for example, the Florida state doesn't accept uh, international students or international lawyers uh, to apply for the bar test, for example. So it's quite limited in what states you can actually go and take tests. Yeah. Uh, and well, the other thing is uh, specifically like if you take the bar, for example, in New York, you will have to apply it in New York and that's it, it's quite limited about it. So I would like to know, for example, if let's say I pick uh, the Florida State University, uh, how am I gonna be able to apply for the bar test from it? Well, Sorry. thank you for your question and thank you for the very, very difficult question. Um, it, is, um, it is true that um, with an LLM, um, you cannot um, take the Florida bar. And so a lot of our students actually target other jurisdictions to take the bar exam. So many of our students are uh, coming here to Florida State and taking the New York bar or we're taking the DC bar um, or taking California and so forth. So you do have options, um, but if, you, if your goal is, I really wanna take the Florida bar, this is where I wanna be because I have family here and so forth. What um, those students typically do is they apply to transfer to our JD program. Um, and so with an LLM, you can transfer to our JD program with the LLM credits, which then you would complete the JD program in two years. So in three years, that means you will earn an LLM and a JD at the same time. And so then that would give you the option of um, taking the Florida bar. But um, if you're not tied down to Florida, there's no reason not to apply to another jurisdiction. And then that kind of opens door el elsewhere. So it, it's up to you whether you really want to take the Florida bar or not. Yeah, so about that, for example, uh, I know that each state has different norms and, and, well, and regulations. So it would be the same to study, for example, in the Florida University, the Florida State University and still apply to the bar test in New York. Uh, yes, so um, so um, what we typically do with our students is when they join the program, when they're applying to the program, we kind of understand which uh, jurisdiction that they're interested in, and then afterwards we kind of plan with them. So, um, for instance, New York has specific course requirements, they have a list of classes, and then we kind of work with those classes. So then we tell you, okay, these are the classes that you should be taking. And so um, the content of those classes don't differ. So for instance, you can take constitutional law in Florida, you can take constitutional law in Nevada, you can take constitutional law in you know, New York, and you're still able to use that knowledge for the bar exam. So um, that's why a lot of students don't necessarily um, need to be in a particular state to take that um, state uh, to take that a uh, bar exam. So some students may choose to um, attend law school in uh, a different state, maybe for different reasons that um, it's a smaller city or it's cheaper and so forth, and then take the bar exam in another jurisdiction. I would choose your LLM program based on the strength of the LLM program and all the intangible qualities that make it a good fit for you. I would not choose your LLM program based on what state you can apply for the bar exam because you can take any bar exam or you could take the bar exam from any state and New York will accept your credits from any state. So the important thing is to find the LLM program that really is the best fit for you. And you as an LLM will be taking it from a, a, a law school in the United States, but mind you are also taking it with other JD students. And the JD students at national law schools are not all from the state. Uh, Boston University, for example, we have we have students from every, all, every state, almost every state in the country, and so they are all taking states back home and their respective home states, or New York, or some of the larger jurisdictions. So find the program that's best for you, and the bar exam will work out. And you certainly can speak to an admissions counselor at any school that you're most interested in, who could walk you through the process specifically. Thank you. And just, I did drop into the chat a uh, link to chart four. This could be helpful. As you may have guessed already, we have a fragmented legal system here in the US. And so every state does have their own requirements. And so the sooner you can start to review those requirements and, and um, get a sense of you know, what will be expected of you, the better. But again, all of us are here to help you along that process. And certainly your LLM programs will have professionals who can um, give you advice and guidance along the way as well. 
Okay, um, so thank you so much, Ali, Zania, Sarah, Andrew, Aaron, Maureen, and Anna. It was lovely, it was interesting. I know there are so many questions around. Um, so thank you for your time and thank you for everyone who attended. Yes, you said it on a Friday, um, not to be expected today, but anyway, uh, we're really happy with the turnout. And I keep posting um, the access to the Zoom links where you can talk to each of the representatives if you are interested to have um, more questions. So if you didn't want to ask questions here, please make sure you copy that link, that drive, um, that Google Drive link. You're going to click over there and then you're going to find the different Zoom links where you can go and join them for um, some extra session and questions or any other reflections that you have. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. Thank you to the reps. Um, we really enjoyed it and we, I learned a lot personally. Um, and thank you, Marina. So just remember, um, we will have three more sessions next week, guys. Do not miss the rest of our um, Education USA LLM uh, series uh, based on the Western Hemisphere, which is basically organized all together. This is a joint venture from the Western Hemisphere. So make sure you join us and keep learning and good luck in your processes. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night.